I'm going to be starting with verse 12 in just a moment. And I want us to, to think about what we have talked about so far. So uh, this year in, in 2023, uh, we are going to be going through the whole book of Luke, uh, verse by verse. Uh, and so, so, so far we've made it to Luke chapter 6, uh, starting with verse 12. But we have, have noticed a lot of things. This, is called, this, this series is called Sitting with Jesus. So we're, go, we're going through the Gospels and we're sitting with Jesus and learning about him and uh, learning to, to really be his disciples. Uh, and so far, we've, we've learned about uh, Jesus being the Son of God, what that means uh, to be the Son of God. We've learned about Jesus being the Holy One of God uh, and how uh, his holiness actually turns us into holy ones. We've talked about um, the, the fact that he's the Lord of worship, and if our worship isn't focused on him, uh, then we have really... Uh, royally missed something. Uh, And so today, we're going to talk about Jesus as the great moral teacher. The great moral teacher. So I want us to start at verse 12, Luke chapter 6, starting at verse 12. Uh, The context here is just previously, Jesus had been called out by the Pharisees for uh, violating the Sabbath And he sort of answers them. In Luke chapter 6, verse 12, he says this, In these days he went out to the mountain to pray. He had his own little Sabbath. And all night he continued in prayer to God. Why? Because the next day he was calling his apostles. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve whom he named apostles. Simon whom he named Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon who is called the Zealot, and Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot who became a traitor. So Jesus goes and he has himself his own little Sabbath on the mountain. He prays all night to God and then he calls from among his disciples. He has other disciples, but he calls from among his disciples 12 who would be his apostles. And he comes down from the mountain, verse 17. He came down with them and he stood on a level place. Okay, so in, in Matthew's account, he goes up to a mountain, uh, and this, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. And here in Luke's account, he goes to a level place. Sometimes this is referred to as the Sermon on the Plain. He stood on a level place, and a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. So all these people are gathered on this level place, this plain, and they've come to, to hear him, they've come to be healed by him. Maybe, as a churchgoer today, maybe you've come to hear Jesus speak. Maybe you've come to hear Jesus speak. Or maybe you recognize the gathering of God's people as a place where healing can happen. Where you can get away from all the junk out there and just be here. Maybe you've come to hear Jesus. Maybe you've come for healing. But I want to ask you an important question today. Are you ready to sit at Jesus' feet as the great moral teacher? Are you ready to sit at Jesus' feet as the great moral teacher? Because as we're about to note uh, when we read this sermon of Jesus's, we're about to note that it's not as easy to call him Lord as you might think. It's not as easy to call him Lord and to call him your great moral teacher and to call him your Lord and be his follower as you might think. It's not as easy. C.S. Lewis puts it this way, after hearing what Jesus says, you've got basically three responses. 
Jesus, after what he says, after all the things that he taught, after all the claims that he made about himself, you have basically three responses. Either Jesus is a liar, Jesus is a lunatic, or Jesus is the Lord. Those are the only real responses to everything that Jesus said. He's either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. And you may be sitting here today, I, I'm, a, I'm a churchgoer, I'm a churchgoer. I would, I would never say that he's a liar or a lunatic. I'm going to challenge you on that because we may not say that with our mouths, but our actions might back up that belief. Our actions might back up that belief. So let's hear what this great Sermon on the Plain tells us about Jesus, about ourselves, and about uh, the world in which we live. So we're going to jump in at verse 20, Luke chapter 6, starting with verse 20. And we're going to notice the, the first great moral teaching that Jesus gives. And the, he's going to give us two great moral teachings in this sermon, okay? Two great moral teachings. And these are moral teachings that change everything. They completely and totally change everything that, in the way that the world works, in the way that we view the world. In fact, these two great moral teachings are the basis for the rest of Jesus' ministry while he was on earth. And they are the basis for our ministry as the hands and feet, as the body of Christ today. The first thing that he teaches is he teaches us a new meaning of value. He teaches us a new meaning of value. I want you to notice verses 20 through 26. Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 26. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples. And he said, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets." Those are the blessings. He continues with the woes in verse 24. But woe to you who are rich. For you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. I want you to think about this. Think about all that he said. Now, when we read Matthew's account, the Sermon on the Mount, we sort of spiritualize this text. Okay? We, we say, well, this is about, uh, this is about uh, those who are poor uh, in spirit. And that's what the text says, poor in spirit. Uh, but we, ma we make a spiritual application about, this, about the Beatitudes, about this text. But here, Luke d offers no sort of application for that. He's talking about people who are poor, and people who mourn, and people who are hungry, people who are weeping. And he is ascribing value to those people. Those lowly people who turn to God, they will be blessed. Blessing for the lowly who turn to God, but woe for the powerful who don't. Throughout the, those first few verses, verses 20 through 23, uh, it talk, it's talking about people who are low, who are down, who have been downcast, who have been pushed to the margins of society. Those people, they turn to God and they will be blessed. But then he talks to the powerful who think they've got it made, who think that they don't need any help, who think they can pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and they don't need God's help and they're self-made men and, and they can do it all themselves. He says, woe to them. Woe for the powerful who don't turn to God. I want you to think about this for a second. Humans attribute value to people based on all kinds of different categories. We view people as valuable based on all kinds of different categories. What are they producing? 
Does this person have a job? Y'all ever attributed value to someone based on whether or not they were employed? What do they consume? Is this person a leech on society? Where were they educated? When were they born? Y'all, we have a problem with ageism in this country. I think it's way more nefarious than other isms. Okay? The fact that young people don't like old people and old people don't like young people and we just judge each other all the time because of it, that's not good. When were they born? Where were they born? People attribute value. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, because I was born in Ohio, I have had people literally tell me that I'm, I'm an outsider. I'm not welcome here in the South because I was born uh, up, up north. I've literally had people say that. Friends, what someone's vocabulary sounds like, how they vote, what their personality is like. We have all kinds of superficial ways of attributing value to people. We do it all the time. And if you think that you don't, I want you to seriously and honestly take inventory of your life and, and what you, how you attribute value to people. I want you to really think about that. Do you attribute value to people the same way that Jesus does? Because he is changing this in this passage. He's flipping it over on its head. Jesus' new meaning of value follows none of those conventions. He attributes value to the sheer fact that we were created by God and whether or not we acknowledge Him as our God. That's what's valuable. Not that you add something to society. Not that you, you uh, don't look like a hippie and you get a haircut. Not that you vote a certain way. He attributes value in a much different way. I think this is a big point, guys. I think this is a, a, a big point for us. I think the world is training us to devalue people who aren't like us. The world is training us to devalue people who aren't like us, who don't look like us, don't act like us, don't talk like us. And Jesus is teaching us something different. Have you all ever read the book, The Hiding Place by Corey Ten Boom? I, I don't know. I, I, I think you all, how many have read it? Do we have anybody in here? Okay, a few. All right. Honestly, I've been, I've been reading this book, and uh, I just, I think it's one of the best Christian books ever written, if I'm being honest. It's absolutely just, it's fantastic. I have, I have laughed. I have cried. I have uh, smiled like an idiot while reading it. It's absolutely wonderful. Th this is a story about uh, a, a woman who uh, lived in Holland during uh, the, the Nazi uh, regime. Okay? When, uh, when Nazi Germany came and invaded Holland, she lived there. And her family was uh, a, a, an integral part of hiding Jews from the Nazis, okay? Their house became a hiding place. So similar story to Anne Frank, but not as well known, all right? And uh, they became a hiding place for the Jews. Well, eventually, I, I don't want to spoil it for you, but I mean, they get caught, okay? Eventually they get caught. And she is in a, a prison, and she's being interviewed by a, a Nazi lieutenant, and she's trying to avoid having to talk about the fact that she was hiding Jews and helping them. And so she starts talking about anything and everything. And one thing that she did, Corey Ten Boom, one thing that she did was she had a ministry for mentally handicapped children in her church. Okay? 
She, uh, she taught and worshipped with mentally handicapped children in her church. And so she started talking to this lieutenant about her teaching mentally handicapped children and how much of a joy it was and how much joy they brought her and how good these little kids were. And the lieutenant tells her to hush and he says, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Why would you waste time on mentally handicapped children? Of course, that was the worldview of the Nazis. Anything less than doesn't have value. Anything less than what we say is valuable doesn't have value. And Corey responds to him, and this isn't an exact quote, but she says, Jesus values things differently than we do. To Jesus, a mentally challenged child might be more important than a rebel leader. She was pointing to herself or a Nazi lieutenant, to Jesus, they're important and they have value. I don't know how you attribute value to people, but whatever the world does, Jesus turns it upside down. It's different. It's different, and it's not the way the world teaches us to attribute value. That is teaching number one, he teaches us a new meaning of value. People have value simply by the fact that they were created by God. They're made in his image. They're his imagers. I've told you all this story before. One time when I was young, uh, my dad and I were at, uh, at a restaurant. We lived in Texas, and, and uh, there's a, a restaurant that's popular out there. It used to be popular. I don't know if it is anymore. It's called Fuddruckers. Okay, I don't know if you've ever been to a Fuddruckers. Uh, got an interesting name, um, but uh, they make burgers, and I remember we were at this restaurant, and uh, we were eating, and there was a, a, a girl there who went to my school. And I don't know what possessed me. I don't know why I did this, but I remember uh, kind of sitting there um, making fun of her, this girl. You know, I think that she wasn't very popular. She wasn't, you know, one of the pretty ones. In fact, I know for a fact this was the girl that brought cookies to our class but forgot to put sugar in them, okay? Yeah, it's awful. You know, everybody's just like munching them down, trying to stomach it. I mean, really, really polite for a third grade class, I mean, if we're being honest. I mean, they, they really tried to be nice, all right? Uh, but I remember I'm, I was kind of making fun of her and my dad. Um, he's pretty aggressive. He kind of grabbed me by the face. <laughs> and he said, Son, she's made in the image of God. She's made in the image of God, and you're making fun of her. And I'll never forget that, and I got in big trouble for that. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I always, I'm really always thankful for my dad uh, kind of calling me out on that. Jesus values people differently. We need to do the same. We need to do the same. The second great teaching, the second great teaching he gives us in this sermon is found in verses 27 through 45. This is a large portion of the sermon. Verses 27 through 45, he teaches us a new way to love. He teaches us a new way to love. Verses 27 through 45. Jesus says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you and from one who takes away your goods. Do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, so do to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. 
for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Continuing on. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will be able to see clearly to take the speck that is in your brother's eye. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Jesus teaches us a new way to love. Specifically within these verses, he teaches us that who we love matters. Who we love matters. We cannot just be people who, who only love people who love us back. We can't just be people who only bless people who bless us back. Who we love matters. We can't just love those people that we get something from in return. Friends, I think that this is, a, uh, this is something the world desperately needs to hear. And honestly, it's something the church desperately needs to hear. Because the church is being formed by the world. Every day. Every day, when we wake up and we turn on the news, we're being formed by the world. Every day, when we go to work, we're being formed by the world. Every day, when we go to school, we're being formed by the world. Every day when we watch videos on YouTube or TikTok or whatever it is that you watch, you're being formed by the world. And we got to be aware of that. The world says we need to worry about ourselves. And love the ones you got. And that's true. We do. But it's also only a half-truth. Jesus says who we love matters. We need to love the unlovable. We need to love the people that are hard to love, that are difficult to love. Jesus teaches us a new way to love, and he teaches us that how we love matters. How we love matters. There are three guiding principles for the love of Jesus found within this text. Verse 31, he tells us the golden rule. Verse 31, he tells us the golden rule. He says, as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Do so to them. Okay? So this is, this is others focused. This is a, a love that is others focused. We, we need to, to do to others as we would have them do to us. The golden rule. Okay? If I want to receive mercy when I've done bad things, then I need to also do that for other people. If I want someone to give me a break, then I need to give other people a break. The golden rule governs the love of Jesus. But that's not the only rule that governs the love of Jesus. The imitation of God also governs the love of Jesus. Notice verses 35 and 36. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expect nothing in return, and your reward will be great and you will be the sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Imitation of God is another rule for the love of Jesus. God loves people, whether they're evil, whether they're good, whether they're, they're bad. No matter what they do, He loves them. And Jesus says you need to imitate Him. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. But then there's a third governing rule for the love of Jesus. A third governing rule for the love of Jesus, and that is the law of sowing and reaping. 
The law of sowing and reaping. Look at verses 37 and 38. Judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. Maybe the golden rule isn't what motivates you. Maybe imitation of God isn't what motivates you. But I want you to think about the law of sowing and reaping. The fact that if we sow good into this world, if we plant good seeds into this world, if we do good for for people regardless of whether they do good back for us, if we plant and plant and plant goodness and mercy and love and kindness and peace, if we do good, there is a reward. There is a reward. For with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. Jesus' love is different. It's different Who we love matters. How we love matters. Remember the golden rule, the imitation of God, and the law of sowing and reaping. If you have trouble loving your enemies, I want you to think about those things. You would want to receive mercy if if the, the tables were turned. God gives mercy to those who hate Him. Imitation of God and Let's just be honest. If you sow good into the world, you're going to reap rewards in the future. You're going to reap rewards in the future. So, this text continues, and he he teaches that sometimes loving people means judging them. But he gives us a wonderful little parable to teach us how we're to judge. He says, look, a blind man will lead another blind man into the ditch. In other words, if you're trying to correct people and judge people and tell people how to live, okay? If you're trying to be nitpicky and correct people and judge people and and, and tell them how they're supposed to live their lives, at least get your life on track first, okay? Look introspectively first. Don't be a blind person trying to lead another blind person because you'll both fall into the ditch. If there is a situation in which love requires that we correct someone, that we uh, judge someone, that we try and bring someone back to the faith, let's make sure that we've pointed the finger to ourselves first. Remove the log from your own eye before you remove the speck from others. There will be occasions when we have to judge others, and we will see the fruit in their lives that makes that the case. And so Jesus concludes with a famous parable, one that our kids know and one that I love. Verse 46 says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose and the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great." Here's where we come and ask the question, is Jesus, in your estimation, as the the words that he's teaching, these two foundational principles, teaches us a new value and a new love, is he a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord? Is he a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord? And I, I know you're sitting there and you're saying, I've called Jesus Lord. I would never consider him a liar or a lunatic. I would never say that but I want you to think about your life and see if that's true. We may not say the words out loud, but do we live the words in our lives? Maybe you call him Lord. Remember, he said there in verse 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Well, the answer might be that you think he's a liar or that you think he's a lunatic. 
Maybe you call him Lord, but deep down inside you don't adopt his moral teachings because you think he is lying. He doesn't really think that the marginal people in this world are of great value. He just wants to sound altruistic. He's just, I'm going to use a word here that I know y'all have used. He is just virtue signaling like some ancient woke person. He doesn't really believe that. He doesn't really believe that. He doesn't really believe that true love turns the other cheek. He's just trying to control you and make you a quiet little sheep. And so you're not really going to do what he says. If you call him Lord, but you don't do what he says, it may be because deep down inside you think he's lying. What he says isn't true. That these values that he's laid down for us as the great moral teacher aren't right. They aren't true. That the values of the world are better. Or... Maybe you call him Lord, but deep down inside you think that these two principles, his new value system and his new way of loving others are actually insane. They're actually insane. Because you know, deep down you say, no sane person would see the weak as highly valued as the powerful. No sane person would would believe that. No person in their right mind would think that that allowing yourself to be mistreated in order to show love to your enemy is a good thing. No one would believe that. I think this is probably the more likely of the two. That doesn't seem logical to us because we've been trained by the world. And yet Jesus lays it down as his law. So you're not really going to do what he says. But I want you to think about something. When you keep on reading the coming chapters of the book of Luke, and you realize that Jesus values the dregs of society when no one else does, And Jesus loves those people who seem unlovable. And you realize that he's done this because in some way it's you that he's valuing and loving. It's you. We're the dregs of society. We're no more valuable than the person that comes on a daily basis to use that blessing box out there. You're not. You're not. It's you he's dying for, despite his innocence. I mean, I remember, I can, I can sit here and vividly recall the lowest moments of my life. I, I know that you can too. You can remember those moments. The lowest, down, dirtiest moments of my life. I remember yelling at my kids in a moment of rage in such a way that I don't know that they'll ever fully trust me again. Low, down, dirty moments. I remember being a nine-year-old with tears running down my face as I watched my dad punch a steering wheel after learning that his wife had moved in with a boyfriend. I remember it. The low, down, dirty moments. I remember these. They play back like a movie in my head. And he remembers them too. He knew about them before I did. He saw past them and he valued valued me and he loved me to the point of dying a sickening death for me and for you. And that's when you call him Lord. When you come to that point, according to the world, you're not valuable. There's something about you that's not valuable. Okay? For many people who aren't believers, the fact that you're a Christian makes you less valuable. Okay? If you vote a certain way, the world thinks that you're less valuable. 
If you don't contribute to society in, in, in a certain way, the world thinks that you're less valuable. If you're a certain age, the world thinks you're less valuable. But not Jesus. Not Jesus. Because he has a different value system and a different way of loving. The love of God was made manifest to us in that while we were still sinners, while we were still his enemies, Christ died for us. And now that we are his friends, he will much more save us. That's when you call him Lord. That's when, as a disciple, you decide to adopt the great moral teaching for yourself and for your family. That's why, that's when Jesus catches like wildfire and turns the world upside down. That's why you became part of a church that actively invites the poor and broken of this community to come into our property where we give them food, despite the fact that the world is grossed out by them, despite the fact that they steal from us, Happened a few weeks ago. Despite the fact that their complete and utter brokenness, in their complete and utter utter brokenness, they've used our trash can to throw away crack pipes and needles. Because you know that the only hope in this world for all of our squalor and struggle is someone who's willing to turn everything upside down and love the unlovable. No one else is doing it. And Jesus did it. And that's why we call him Lord. Because he did it for us. And let's lay aside all the ideas about what's valuable, what's loving, what's good. Let's lay aside all those ideas that the world has taught us. Let's sit at the, great, at the feet of the great moral teacher, Jesus. Let's value the way that he values and love the way that he loves. And recognize that he's doing that for us. I want to offer you an invitation today. We have a tradition here. We sing what's called an invitation song. During this song, you can come sit on one of these front pews and ask for prayers, and ask for Bible study, ask for baptism, whatever it is that you need. If you don't feel comfortable coming forward to one of these pews, you can talk to one of our elders in the back. We'd love to help you. We'd love to do anything for you. That's why we're here. We're not here to make ourselves feel good. We're here to love Jesus and love each other. If you need something, don't hesitate. We're going to sing this song. Come and talk to us as we stand and as we sing.